everyone. Thank you for listening to our second webinar as part of the 2024 CKF webinar series. This session will focus on the world of pancreas transplants. My name is Anna Morgan Pilardi. I am the Program and Communications Director at the Chris Klug Foundation, otherwise known as CKF. Um, I would like to first start by thanking the sponsors of today's webinar, Hearts for Rust, who have done a wonderful uh, job of sponsoring these webinars and do fabulous work in the community. I would also like to thank our wonderful speakers who will be joining us shortly. Thank you to all those who have submitted questions before today's session. If you have further questions for today's panelists, please send them to info at chrisklugfoundation.org. If you are interested in any other topics we will be discussing, head to chrisklukefoundation.org slash CKF webinar series. Uh, without further ado, I'd like to get started and introduce today's panelists and give them a moment to introduce themselves. First, I would like to introduce Jen, who became a pancreas and kidney transplant recipient and the president and founder of Transplant Journey. Thanks for joining us, Jen. Thank you so much, Anna, for having me. I really appreciate it. I received my gift of life in 2015 from Columbia, New York Presbyterian Medical Center. Thank you. Thanks, Jen. Next up, we have Glenda, who in keeping with the theme is also a pancreas and kidney transplant recipient and is celebrating 24 years post transplant. Thanks for joining us, Glenda. Thank you, Anna. Actually, on June 23rd this year, I will celebrate my 25th anniversary. So, That's amazing. <laughs> I know. I, we feel pretty amazed about it, I have to say. Uh, from Wild Cornell here in New York City. Awesome. Congratulations for the for the early or an early congratulations. Thank you. Our final speaker is Callie and the newest member of the SPK squad receiving her pancreas and kidney transplant recipient just seven months ago. Thanks for joining us, Callie. Thank you for having me. Um, yes, I received my simultaneous kidney pancreas at Wake Forest Baptist Health here in North Carolina, um, June 10th, 2023. Thanks. We're from all over the place today. Normally everybody's like one place, but today is everywhere. I love it. <laughs> yeah. So thank you all for joining us. Um, without uh, any holdups, let's get into some questions. Um, Jen, I'm going to start with you. Can you talk to your experience awaiting your transplant and how you felt when you received the call? I was I was in total shock and disbelief. Um, I don't want to scare people when I when I say this, but I spent seven years on dialysis waiting for my transplant to happen. So I was actually having a treatment when I received the call and I had gone through so many ups and downs of, of the roller coaster ride. I was like, mm, it's just another call with an offer that isn't gonna pan out. So I didn't think this was really gonna be the true offer that came through. Um, so when they called, I was like, mm, it's another one that's not gonna happen for me. So, when they called and said, how soon can you be here? I was like, yeah, okay. You know, we can be there in, you know, two hours. And they said, okay, great. Go home, get your stuff, take a shower um, and be here as soon as possible. And I was like, ah, okay, we can make that happen. Not a problem. And when we finally arrived um, at Columbia, I was, I was a little disappointed to be honest. Um, because there was no band, there was no bells, there was no whistles going on, which is what I think, you know, most transplant patients think is going to happen um, because you've been waiting so long for this incredible transplant to take place. And everyone else is just like, it's every day things going on. And, and they just, okay, go in, have a seat, you know, get yourself ready. And, and that's all. And I was truly in disbelief, like, wow, it's really going to happen. It's going to take place. And, and it was just, I mean, that's what they do. They make miracles happen. And, and you're still pinching yourself like, I'm going to go into surgery in the next couple of hours. Um, and it was, it, I mean, it was life-changing. I'm here to talk about it now. But I, I was still in disbelief until I actually was in the OR I was like, it's not happening. It's not happening. It's not happening. I, I didn't, I didn't believe it. I, I had tears streaming down my face um, as I was going into the OR. Was that from happiness or fear? <laughs> it was both. It was, it was a little bit of both. It was still a little bit of both. Yeah. Yeah. 
No, I think a lot of the time people people don't realize that it isn't the first call you're going to get, um, isn't the time you're going to get your transplant. There's quite often a few calls that you might get um, before it's transplant day. Ab- absolutely. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. A total, a total, total emotional roller coaster ride for sure. Yeah. 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 Glenda, I'm going to move to you. What did the transplant process look like for you? How did your life change during the time between receiving your diagnosis and when you finally received your transplant? Well, first of all, you have to realize things were a little bit different 27 years ago. No cell phones. No, you know, a little bit different. Um, but we actually, I think we were well prepared and I can tell you some things I did, but how did life change? Well, as soon as I got my diagnosis of type one diabetes, which I'd had for 40 years, um, destroying my kidneys, then I had to start seeing a nephrologist. Then I had to start watching my blood pressure very carefully and watching what I eat very carefully, because besides being on a diabetic diet, I was also on the kidney diet. And it doesn't leave a lot in between that is decent for you to to have. So uh, my husband and I try to remember what I ate during those, those, actually it was about 14 months that I was on the list. I, I honestly don't remember. The favorite things that I ate as a diabetic, I couldn't eat on the kidney diet, like tomatoes and mushrooms and things like that. Um, but I only waited 14 months, which is different than it is now. I happened to get my transplant before I went on dialysis. I had my fistula. I was about two months out. My brother had also offered to give me a kidney. And we were going to do that over the 4th of July weekend in Minneapolis. But then I got three calls over the weekend of June 20, 20th, because my transplant was on a Wednesday. Three calls. The third one was a charm. And I received my transplant. The call came at like, they told me to come in at 2 o'clock in the morning. And we were sitting there on the bed. The surgeon walks in in his scrubs. And he said, well, how are you guys doing? And we said, well, wait, how are you doing? You're just, you still have your scrubs on. He said, oh yeah, a quick nap and I'll be fine. So I was prepared. My husband was prepared. I was not scared, Jen. I was not scared. I just knew this was meant to be, and it was going to be great. Living without diabetes was going to be like a whole new life. So, you know, it, it was fairly different because of the 14 months, I think. People wait a lot longer now because it's the whole kidney issue. Um, they've changed those rules like three times since I got my transplant. And um, I hope they're not going to change it anymore. I think, I think it's working well the way it is now. So, yeah, it's a new life. It's a new life. Amazing. Thank you for sharing. I think that, yeah, the diet is something that often is overlooked, but is so critical, um, especially for for those uh, suffering from diabetes, but other transplants as well. You know, your diet is greatly affected um, um, by that. Callie, I'm going to move to you next. What was your support network like during and post-transplant? How did you utilize that network? Well, my support network was phenomenal. I was definitely blessed in that aspect. Um, My family has, we've always been very tight knit. So of course they've been there through, from day one, you know, I was diagnosed with type one diabetes at the age of three. Um, And after 32 years, I remember, you know, we had slowly, we had been monitoring my kidney function over the years. And I was kind of coasting at stage three kidney um, disease for a few years. And then I got COVID twice. Um, and that quickly sent me into end stage. Um, so I remember calling my mom one day and, you know, they, they were respectful of, of me and, um, my a doctor's appointments and everything. They never pried too much. Um, they let me kind of handle it on my own, but I remember talking to my mom recently about this and she said, do you remember calling me prior to your nephrologist appointment and telling me to come with you that it wasn't going to be good. And I said, I do remember that phone call. She's like, I will never forget that phone call. Um, And 
so mom, she's a registered nurse. She, she's, she's no, you know, newbie to the medical field. I worked in the medical field 13 years. We're, we're both kind of aware of, you know, how things happen. And, um, so she was my main person going throughout all of this. Um, my, my dad, of course, was there. He was, he's the insurance guy. He was helping me with insurance stuff. And, you know, he's the numbers guru. Me and mom, not so much. You know, we can, we can do the, the hands on stuff. Um, and then, but dad, he's, he's the numbers guru. So he, he helped in that aspect. Um, I had a, I had a small circle of friends that I told. Um, about what was going on with me, the people who were there on, you know, almost on a daily basis who, you know, had, in, you know, kept in contact with, they, they knew. And then of course, my coworkers knew, um, my coworkers, they, they were, they were a godsend. Um, you know, I had actually started this job a few months prior to my diagnosis, my end stage diagnosis. Um, and they, you know, they were phenomenal. They worked with my schedule. I had the option to work remote, um, you know, and so I continued to work full time throughout my diagnosis, treatment, everything. Um, so my support system, I could not have asked for a better one. And I really did lean a lot on them, which was very hard for me because, you know, I am a very independent person. You know, I um, I, I have my own home. I, I just, I like, you know, I, I have my, my set routine and I do for myself as I always have done for myself as much as I could. Um, and so relying on others to help with even mundane things like pay my bills, um, because I couldn't remember to, I had so much brain fog. Um, I couldn't remember to do small mundane everyday things, you know, daily activities, I needed help. And that was hard to ask for that help. But I don't know, I wouldn't be where I am right now if I didn't have those people in my corner backing me up and supporting me and picking me up because of how far I had fallen. So, you know, the the support aspect of it, I was, I'm very grateful for, will always be grateful for. Um, and I just, I, I'm very lucky. I know I'm very lucky to have had a good core group of people in my life who have stuck, who have continued to stick by my side, even post transplant, because that's been a whole different journey in itself. I don't think any of us could have gotten by without a really good support system. At I, home. Knew I, I know. My, yeah. yeah. My husband was right there beside me all through those years of diabetes of 14 years. Once we knew I had kidney trouble. 14 years. And can you imagine he followed my diet pretty much mm -hmm. with me? Yeah. And uh, without his support and bringing me a donut right after my transplant, when I could finally eat, who could ask for more than that? <laughs> the ultimate gift. <laughs> <laughs> That's amazing. Yeah, it is. It is so important. Den, did you want to add something? Yeah. Yeah. I was just going to say, I think it's it's really crucial if if you don't have um, a support system at home that you have to kind of create your own support system. Uh, because, you know, as much as you have the love maybe in your home, um, a lot of people don't have that. Right. And your family can't relate to what you're going through if they haven't been through it themselves. And they can, they can support you, of course, um, your friends can support you, but unless you've walked through it, it's very difficult to relate to what you're going through and they can't understand it. So uh, I, I just I think support groups are really important because we can relate to one another on what we've all been through, whereas sometimes family and friends really can't understand what we're going through. And, and that can be really important if you don't have um the support system of, of family and, and friends, which is what's really lacking. And, and I found that from talking to other um, transplant recipients in, in the transplant community and, and space. I'll piggyback off that. That's how I met Jen, um, because I was struggling after my transplant, being able to relate to people um, or to feel like um, my my feelings, my emotions, what I was going through was truly understood, e even from the medical team. Um, you know, they're, you know, they're wonderful in their own ways. But to, you know, I didn't fully, fully have someone who 
I felt like I could relate with. Um, and that's actually how I found Jen. And I, I just went on Facebook one day and I, I Googled su- transplant support groups and she popped right up. And I started reading on, on this group and I'm like, wow, this is phenomenal. So I, I you know, I, I had asked to join and I, I saw a post that Jen had put. Um, and it said that she was a, a kidney pancreas transplant or transplant recipient as well. And I just automatically like, yes, here is someone who understands she's the first other, she's the only other or the first person I've met who had had a kidney pancreas. And I just automatically felt a connection to. So this, their support group has been so very healing to me in a lot of ways um, to be able to um, voice concerns or, you know, I, you know, have, I've had a, I put a few questions on there about, you know, what is ever the other people's experiences with, with this or with this. And I get, so much feedback um, that it's just it it has it truly is a lot of help and it has definitely been um, filled that missing void that I had when it came to my support. We have that now because there are online groups. There's Facebook. Jen has uh, support group meetings on Zoom. When I got my transplant, there was no internet. So. So we met uh, at the hospital. The hospital had a support group. And then we discovered uh, the support group that uh, met in another area, most who had their transplants from another hospital. But it was just that face-to-face sharing of information. You don't think of all the questions you want to ask when you're being told you're going to get a transplant. I mean, you can think of the major things you want to ask, but you don't know about drug side effects. You don't know... You don't know a million things and you can't even think of the million things to ask the question. So, yes, I I support that 1000 percent. Support groups are very, very important. Yeah, definitely. Especially um, obviously pancreas transplants are a lot less common than, you know, a lot of other transplants. So there's a lot fewer recipients out there to have those connections with. So it's really important to reach out in these support groups, make those connections um, um, and help you know, find help. Um, it actually leads me perfectly into to my next question. Uh, Glenda, many transplant recipients often struggle with mental health during, after their transplants. Is that something that affected you at all? And if yes, how did you handle that? I'll, I'll tell you what I did. I did a couple of things. Number one, I got from the transplant center a list of people who had the same transplant, the simultaneous kidney pancreas. And I called five of them. Because I wanted to know if this is going to be a very painful surgery. I was afraid of the pain. And I wanted to know how long theirs lasted and what trouble they had. Every single one of the five said to me, you're the first person who's ever called me. Which shocked me. I mean, people go into this major surgery and they don't want to know what they're getting into. Anyway, um, the other thing I did, because I was afraid of the pain, was I actually went to the phone book. We had phone books at that time and looked up mind body healing. And I found a guy whose first name was Nolan. And I went to him. He taught me self hypnosis so that I could calm myself. You know, I was, a, I was afraid of the pain. I, nobody could tell me, nobody told me that for three days you're just pushing the drug button so you don't really feel anything. But um, he was wonderful. He taught me how to, um, you know, go to my special place and be calm. So I thought, I think that was exceptionally important to me that I, I knew I could control myself. Um, and, and my other thought was I am going to be able to live without diabetes. Type one diabetes is not fun. It is on your shoulders 24 seven. And I was, you know, you count everything. You count every step you take. You count everything that goes in your mouth. You count the insulin. We didn't have insulin pumps. I was up to eight shots a day by the time I got my transplant. So I was mixing insulin because the the types were long lasting, lasting and short lasting. They didn't have all the different things they have now, but I was so looking forward to this change in life I think I did not have a mental crisis and all those things I did helped me. 
one more thing. My husband found a series of tapes from, um, oh gosh, I can't remember, from Columbia Presbyterian, I think, Jen, um, or at least that's where he learned it, that were called uh, Surgical Preparation and Healing. And one of the ta tapes, we don't even listen to tapes anymore, do we? One of the tapes was preparing for surgery. And I would listen to it every day. It was about 45 minutes. And my husband said he never saw me sleep so peacefully as I did during that that tape. And it was, uh, you know, new age music. And you're going through this, but it's going to help you. You're going to be healthy. You're that kind of talk to inside your head while you're sleeping, I think made a big difference in staying calm through this whole process. So I don't feel I had any mental crises. Anybody else? I definitely, I yeah, did. I did. I, I struggled post-transplant very much um, with the mental, emotional side of it, um, which is why I searched for the support group. And, you know, I just, I don't, honestly, I don't feel like I was fully prepared going in. I was, I was ready for the pain. The pain didn't scare me. Um, I, and then prior to, I, they were, when I was diagnosed with the end stage, I don't know if it's just me. I don't know um, if anybody else had this, but I just felt an overwhelming sense of peace that things were going to be the way that they were supposed to be. Um, they were going to happen the way that they were supposed to happen, um, you know, and um, I had a, I just, you know, the months prior up to um, my transplant, I was just, I was very much at peace and I was ready for whatever life threw at me. Um, now, after, <laughs> um, you know, after you get through the, the pain part after the surgery, you know, you get through the pain part and, you know, you're kind of quote on the other side. Um, I think that the hard part for me was um, is was trying to figure out my emotions that were surrounding or that I was feeling, you know, I, I struggled with survivor's guilt um, really bad for quite a while. And, um, and I didn't understand, I didn't, I didn't know prior to that that was a common occurrence, number one, for uh, transplant recipients. Um, and I, I didn't really know why I was feeling that way. So I had to do a lot of um, soul searching afterwards. And um, just kind of self-realization and taking the time to um, figure out why I was feeling a certain way uh, or what, what I was feeling and why I was feeling that way. So that was the part I actually struggled with the most. It wasn't the physical part of it. Um, I look back and I breezed through that part. You know, it was, it was bad when it was bad, but after it was over, I was, you know, I, I'd look back and I had breezed right through it. Um, so that part actually was the hardest for me afterwards was the emotional aspect of things. Jen, what about you? Um, so for myself, I guess, interesting. I, I was in a very dark place prior to transplant just because I think I, I had to wait so long for my transplant. So probably by year five, I was at the point of being ready to give up. I never thought the transplant was actually going to happen. Um, and, you know, I was like, I, I'm ready to give up on life. The only reason I really didn't give up on life was because of my family um, and, and the support that they gave me. And I was like, they would be absolutely devastated, um, you know, if I was gone. So I have to keep fighting for them. You know, they've given me so much. They've invested so much in me. I have to keep pushing for them. And, and that was really what kind of kept me going. But I mean, there were some very dark times. There were some really, really dark days. And I mean, I, I was extremely sick. Um, you know, I, I sought out um, counseling and the counselor was of no help. Um, there was no one really, I would say, well versed in diabetes, um, you know, kidney care that could relate to what I was going through, you know, and, and side story, um, he was coming to my house because I was so sick. And he fell asleep while I was talking to him. Oh no! <laughs> oh, my God. That's yeah. awful. I didn't yeah. charge you for that time, Jen. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, 
good I, good thing is I'm able to look back on it now and laugh about it. Um, but that's not good when you're when you're dealing with someone um, who's in a very fragile state and you're reaching out for help, right? So yeah, it was it was it was very tough. Um, and and you know, on a side note, I mean, I actually you know because I had so many offers that that didn't come through in the end. Um, and at one point, I actually had to take myself off the list. Um, and become inactive because I was actually so scared of what it was going to look like because the surgeons had told me, Jen, uh, you're going to have tubes here, this, that, whatever. Um, I was like, oh my God, that sounds so incredibly scary. And I had no one to reach out to who'd had an SPK. And I was like, this is so overwhelming. I, I, I can't even imagine what this is going to be like. So it was really taking an emotional toll on me um, for a period of time. So I kind of, you know, maybe lost out on, I can't remember if I took myself off for four or six months. I think it was almost six months of time. Yes, I was accruing the time, but, you know, an offer could have come to me in, in those six months, but I wasn't mentally prepared for that um, because of everything that I'd heard when that one offer was presented to me, but, you know, like I said, never panned out. Um, and then after the transplant was difficult for me also, and again, I, I had to reach out for help because I didn't know about the support groups that were out there. I had no idea how to go about accessing them. Um, it seemed to me as though everyone else was so excited for this incredible gift that I'd been given, but I wasn't. And I, I knew to myself, okay, something's not right here. And I don't know if it was because I had waited so long and I didn't want to like jinx myself. And I was like, okay, no, no, no. If I get so excited, and yeah, 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 yeah. But what if something goes wrong, right? It was like, I just, I couldn't celebrate it yet, right? Because it was like, oh my God, look at this. I'm, I'm free of diabetes. I'm free of dialysis. And everyone else was like, Jen, isn't this the best? And I was like, oh my God, this is the best. This is absolutely incredible. And I was truly living and still am the best life ever. But I just, I couldn't get as excited as everyone else was. And I knew there was, some, I knew there was something wrong with that. So I, I had to go out and, and seek help for that. Yeah. Well, Jen, you also, you also had the fact that you couldn't walk and you had to learn how to walk again. Yeah. Yeah. So that, yeah. that, you know, it wasn't all celebratory at the end for you. <laughs> Once you got your transplant, you had a lot you still had to do. I did. I did. Often people think it's a, it's a cure and you're done and you got your transplant and you went out the door the next day and it's, it's not, it, there's a whole nother life to it. Um, and there's, you know, the recovery process is probably just in some ways, just as hard as the pre um, process. It's, it's completely different. Um, and they don't call it a life changing event for nothing. Jen, since your transplant, you have become a strong advocate for those in the community. What inspired you to choose this path? Actually, that that answer is simple, simple, but a little complex. Um, honestly, I, I did it for two reasons, really. It was one reason I wanted to honor my donor hero and his family um, and really give back to him for this incredible gift that, that I was given. And really because when I was going through the journey myself, my family was an incredible support to me. And had it not been for my family, I would have no, had nowhere to turn to. And um, I've really, since I started volunteering in the very beginning, I've seen how many people lack that incredible support that I had. And I realized, I was so sick. My family did all that work for me. And most people don't have that and don't know what credible resources are out there. Um, you know, what website is legitimate? What organizations are legitimate? Where do they turn to? Where do they start? It's so overwhelming. And when you're sick, you're not capable of doing this when you're exhausted, whether you're on dialysis or need to start dialysis. If you're trying to work a job, if you have a family um, going from doctor appointment to doctor appointment, 
uh, you know, the little things, uh, you have a family, you have a loved one, you have a home to try and keep, bills you're trying to cover, fighting with insurance companies, Medicare, Medicaid, I mean, I can go on and on, getting groceries, um, the exhaustion that you face, difficulty breathing, um, the whole nine yards, how are you able to do all this and, and, and find support for yourself? So I wanted to be this organization that people could come to um, and say, point me in the right direction. It's a simple thing. Um, I'm having difficulties with my diet um, and this is the organ that I need. Um, Jen, I don't know how to eat properly. Can you refer me to a dietitian? It's a simple, a simple thing like that. And the problem is, I think doctors, of course, want to help as much as they can, but they can't do that in 20 minutes. It's just not possible. And unfortunately, that's all um, that patients are given nowadays. And I, and I joke, I can't even get through my medication list in like 20 minutes, right? So how are they going to cover all of this um, with patients when, when you're overwhelmed and you have all this stuff going on? It's, it's just, it's really difficult. So that was truly why, why I did this. And and also, like I said, to really give back to, to my donor hero and, and his family for this incredible gift that I've, that I've been given and just to help others kind of not go through what I went through and have the, the feelings that, that I went through. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks for everything you do, Jen. It's, it's oh, really no. Great. I mean, okay. you please, you guys are, are right there in it with me. So absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. I mean, the Chris Klug Foundation is incredible. So I'm, I'm happy to be a part of it with you guys. Thank you. We give it a try. We give it a try. <laughs> okay, Callie, um, has your pancreas transplant affected your ability to maintain sort of a healthy, active lifestyle? Do you feel it's important to try and remain as active as you can pre and post transplant? How did that look for you? Absolutely. So, you know, pre transplant is when it looked, um, it looked different for me. You know, prior to my diagnosis, I was I was a very active person. I, I am 100% an outdoor girl. If it's outside, I want to be there and I want to be doing it. Um, whether, you know, that's hiking or gardening or mowing the yard, I, I love it all. Um, so I was, you know, I was very active prior to going in and, you know, and being a diabetic for 32 years, I was following a diabetic diet, but I kind of took it a step further and um, switched main, just to plant-based, um, a plant-based diet instead. Um, I, you know, done research and, 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 you know, saw that it was just a healthier lifestyle overall. So, I mean, years prior to, you know, my, my diagnosis of, um, end-stage renal disease, I was plant-based. So, um, still counting the carbs that I did eat, still counting every single carb and, and, and I'm watching everything that, you know, I put in my mouth, but then kind of just took it to a different level with the plant-based. Um, after my transplant, of course, right after the activity level is non-existent. Um, but about my six month mark, I, I, I kind of felt like I had a little bit of life in me again and was ready to start, um, start getting back out there. So, you know, getting back into hiking, you know, it's, it's a little cold where I'm at right now. Um, so hiking has not been a whole lot, uh, since transplant, but, you know, as far as getting outside and, and, you know, fiddling around in the yard, absolutely. Like I just, you know, my activity level is finally, I kind of feel like I'm getting back to where I was. My lifestyle, as far as my diet, it hasn't changed. I have continued to stay plant-based. I can still, I continue to count carbs in my head. I don't think I'll ever get to a point where I won't do that. Okay. You know, no, it's it is. Yep. It is. Um, and, um, you know, and this kind of goes back to what uh, Jenna had said earlier when she was talking about how everybody's like, you know, oh, you're no longer diabetic anymore. That must be great. And I'm sitting over here. I'm like, well, it's, it, it's not, you know, I, I still have that diabetic mindset. I'm still watching everything that I, I put into my body and, and still, you know, mentally counting all these you know, carbs. And I'm like, Callie, you don't have to do that anymore. You know, but I don't think, I don't think I'll ever not do that. And and I'm okay with that. Um, I, I, I like, um, 
I'm happy with how my, you know, diet is, was before and and is now. Um, During, it was a little difficult, again, going back to what Glenda was saying, you know, you're following a diabetic diet, but then you're following a kidney diet as well. And she's right. There's a lot of things that it doesn't leave you with a whole lot of options on what you can have. Um, And um, one of the big things with, you know, the kidney diet that I was on was, you know, protein, 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 you know, they just really wanted me to take in a lot of protein. And that was, that was the hardest part for me. So during that, like the in-between phase for me, I started, you know, incorporating more protein as far as chicken and, and, and fish um, into my diet, which was abnormal for me. But since then I've kind of backed off on that as well. And just kind of in moderation, you know, we'll still get, you know, there's, you know, certain things into my diet, but overall, it's not really affected me a whole, whole lot. I think the diets completely contradict one another, really. The They do. Yeah. The renal diet versus the diabetic diet. Everything they do. on the diabetic diet, you're like, okay, I finally got this under control. And then you're thrown this renal diet and it's like, wait, what? Now I'm supposed to eat, you know, the white rice, the white bread, that that's not what I was trained as a diabetic. And 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 when I was on dialysis, I, I kind of kept saying, but wait a minute, that's gonna throw my sugars completely out of whack. Which one do you guys want me to follow? It was kind of like every week it was an argument, well, this number is up here, this number is up here. Um my levels are constantly doing this. So it's really tough. I would joke and say, so I'll just eat cardboard instead and I'll be fine. Like really. I actually, no, I actually had the same exact conversation with uh, my nutritionist, my, for, you know, with my dialysis team, um, because, you know, she's used to be a nutritionist strictly for, you know, the dialysis patients, not the diabetic patients, um, you know, and, and after, being being diabetic for 32 years, I, I knew I knew what I could and could not do. Like so, you know, me and her would kind of go back and forth on what was you know acceptable. Uh, you know, what she would say, "Well, you need to eat this, this, and this," I, I, and I would say, "No, no," because that's going to shoot my blood sugar through the roof. I can't do that. I can't eat these things that you're telling me to eat. So I kind of had to go rogue and do my own research and and figure out a common ground between the two. Some days were easier than others. I did a, I, every single meal that I ate, I made myself, you know, there was no salt in any of my meals that guys, you know, salt is a no, no, um, with kidney and, you know, and I just, I kind of took it like every single day. I just like, all right, how can I do something? What what can I do today that, you know, that will fit within this teeny tiny little box that I'm supposed to fit into? So that was, that was hard. That was extremely hard. Uh-uh. I don't, I don't miss that part of it. <laughs> but no. It's funny that after transplant, almost all of my friends were amazed that they could watch me eat whatever I wanted. You can eat dessert. This is so wonderful. And I'm saying to myself, you don't get half of what's wonderful about this. It's not that I can eat anything I want. It's all the other stuff that is all in the background. Well, and a lot of people don't realize too that we can still get diabetes again. Like we, yes, we can eat all these, all these carbs and all this sugar. Of course we can. We can get diabetes again, just as easily as the next person. So, you know, it's, you know, we're still having to do, you know, think about the future and, 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 you know, taking preventative measures to not get back to where we were originally, you know, it's, you know, just because we can, doesn't mean that we should. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. That life of moderation. Right. Well, I am going to wrap up today with one last question for everybody. Um, we always sort of wrap up with this question. Um, if you could give one piece of advice to an individual or family who's currently on the wait list or just received their transplant, what would it be? Well, I'll start. I think that it is most, most, most important before and after the transplant to make a team out of your healthcare providers. You have an after transplant follow up doctor, you have a nephrologist, you have a skin doctor. 
you have a throat doctor, you have a foot doctor. You, you, they have to work together. I don't do anything that any doctor tells me to do without saying, please talk to my transplant follow-up doctor. And if they don't want to, which is not true, most of them are quite happy to do that, um, I will do it. I won't put anything in my mouth from any doctor without checking with my transplant follow-up doctor, who happens to be a nephrologist. But they told us early on that transplant is a team sport and you have to make sure you keep it that way. My husband goes with me to every doctor appointment and he takes notes. We go in with a list of questions and he takes notes because I'm trying to listen. I can't be writing at the same time. And he catches things that I didn't quite hear. So it's important to have that team behind you. Yeah, I would, I would, I would piggyback just on the Glenda thing. Um, bring your phone and just record it, right? If you, if you can't bring someone with you, um, bring your phone and record it. Cause you can't always bring an extra set of ears sometimes. I think that's, that's really useful to do. And I'll kind of add to that with, you know, how important it is to be, be able to be your own advocate. Um, and, 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 you know, feel comfortable being able to question and, or to just ask questions and, and, you know, not just, you know, be told something and not ask why I'm a why person. Um, if you tell me something, I want to know why I want to learn. I want to, I want to understand why the answer, why you gave me the answer that you gave me. Um, so I'm, yeah, I'll pay it back off that just a little bit. Um, but my biggest piece of advice to anybody who is pre- in, right in the middle or post transplant is, you know, my biggest thing was um, to sh to show grace, you know, not just to the people around you, but to yourself, you know, give yourself time to process your emotions um, to, you know, kind of to wait before jumping back into work. If you're stressed about work, just give your time, give your, give your body, give your mind time to heal, show yourself grace. That was one of the hardest things that I struggled with was um, being patient with myself and giving myself grace. So that would be my biggest piece of advice. And, and mine would be keep the faith and try and stay positive. Um, even, even when it gets dark, right. And that even if the one offer doesn't pan out, try and tell yourself, perhaps maybe this organ wasn't meant to be, and that another one will come along. Um, and that also always advocate for yourself, like, like Callie said, um, that's most important. And then one more little tidbit, um, I, I would say, you know, that, um, you know, you really um, have to keep in mind that once you're transplanted, the journey does not end there. Um, and and the phrase, that, yeah, the phrase that I know um, Glenda and Callie will, will definitely jump on board with is that transplant is not a cure, it's a treatment um, and that it's, it's continuous, right? So don't think that, oh, I got my transplant, we're done. No, it's, and, and it's, it's it's the medication that you have to be you know on board with. It's the lab work. It's the follow ups. It's you know the insurance. It's Medicare, Medicaid. It's you know it just it, it keeps going right. So you have to you have to really be a strong proponent for yourself. You still have to pay attention. Pay attention to what you're thinking. Pay attention to what you're feeling, and I mean physically as well as mentally. You have to constantly be proactive. It's it's not just like Jen said, it's just not you're done and you just kind of coast through. It's not. You have to constantly be proactive in, in your health um, and constantly have that line of communication with your providers. That's it doesn't end, but it's so worth it. Yeah, there you go. I agree. It's so worth it. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. Well, thank you all. That was definitely inspiring. I've got goosebumps. <laughs> so that is it for today's session. I want to thank each of our speakers uh, for sharing their journeys and being so open um, today. Thank you all for tuning in to today's session. We hope you have 
found it inspiring and informative. Uh, again, if you have any questions or want to learn more, head to chrisklugfoundation.org. We hope you have a great rest of your day and stay safe, stay healthy and live life, give life. <laughs>